Yeah, good morning, everyone. It's a, a pleasure to be here and quite flattering uh, for me to be invited as, as a, a, for a Hero of Science lecture at the Max Planck Institute. Uh, on my title slide, you can already see my background in astrophysics. And um, it also is like a journey uh, that is laid out here with the topics, a journey across uh, the flat Earth. I want to start with some basics, uh, including basic information about uh, climate change, to just to know what the background, scientific background of all this is. And I want to start with Alexander von Humboldt, who was uh, one of the first, maybe the first, uh, to write in 1843 that humans are changing the climate, quote, by cutting down forests and by releasing large amounts of steam and gas at the centers of industry. Recently, I gave a talk together with an Alexander von Humboldt expert, and he said, uh, yes, Humboldt did know about the greenhouse effect, which was first described by uh, Fourier in 1824. And uh, we don't quite know what Humboldt meant with steam, whether at that time he was, like we do today, uh, taking it uh, to be a water vapor or not. But basically, this quote uh, is... Uh, very correct, and Humboldt, like in many subjects, was ahead of his time there. Now, make a big jump forward to 1896, when the Swedish uh, later Nobel laureate Svante Arrhenius was the first one to try and calculate the climate sensitivity, that is, how much global warming do you expect from a doubling of CO2 concentration in the atmosphere, uh, he redid this calculation about 10 years later uh, in an improved way, and then he arrived at a climate sensitive sensitivity of 4 degrees Celsius for a CO2 doubling. This value is um, a little bit high. Today we think it's around 3 degrees, but we still have an uncertainty range between 2 and 4 degrees for this critical parameter, which basically tells us how strongly the Earth will respond to an increase in carbon dioxide, or more generally in radiative forcing, as we call it. Of course, we all know that the greenhouse gases in the atmosphere are increasing dramatically. This is 100% due to human activities. The most important of these gases is carbon dioxide in terms of the radiative forcing, so the change in the Earth's uh, radiation balance and just the increase in CO2 concentration by 50%, which we have already caused, increases the amount of heat available to heat the climate system by two watts per square meter of Earth's surface, day and night, round the clock. So uh, that is the reason why it's getting warmer, because we're adding energy to the system. It is uh, elementary physics, basically. The Earth, that is something that Fourier recognized in, in 1824, by the way, when he looked at the heat budget of planets. The planets heat up to the point uh, where they radiate enough long wave radiation back into space to balance what is coming in from the sun. The warmer a physical body is, the more long wave it radiates, and this balance simply arises um, uh, and sets the temperature of any planet, including planet Earth. We can see this uh, concentration of greenhouse gases in our atmosphere uh, back to nearly a million years now from the ice cores in Antarctica, uh, where you have ice that is so old, the, the deeper you drill, the older it is, and it contains air bubbles where we have samples of the ancient air, which can be analyzed for greenhouse gas content. And, uh, from that, we know that the CO2 concentration now is uh, much higher than at least in one million years. Probably you have to go back more than 15 million years to find similarly high CO2 levels as we have today. The consequence of those uh, additional two watts per square meter heating from the CO2 alone are seen here. This is the famous warming stripes, one way to show the global average temperature. Every stripe is one year. It starts in 1880 on the left and goes up to last year. The conventional way to show the same data is as a data curve like this, which now also has an advantage that it has a scale on the left, 
where you see that we are now at 1.2 degrees above the late 19th century temperature. And that is highly relevant if you consider that in the Paris Agreement, all nations agreed to pursue efforts to limit that warming to 1.5. So we are actually now already at uh, 1.2, heading for 1.3. We have a very, very small margin still to stop global warming. I will come back to this at the end of my talk. Now, this warming was actually predicted before it was observed. Uh, and the first official government report about global warming resulting from fossil fuel use was uh, published uh, in 1965, uh, ordered by the then US President Lyndon B. Johnson. It's a famous Revell report, which basically already contains the key information that fossil fuel use will increase uh, the global temperature it will start melting continental ice sheets, it will increase the sea level, and so on. Now, a couple of decades later in 1988, the famous NASA climate scientist uh, Jim Hansen was the first to proclaim in a, in a Senate hearing in the US that global warming is here now. The global warming that we have long predicted can now be seen in the observational data, they are outside the natural range of variability. And this made the, the cover of the New York Times. And I can remember this day quite well because I was a PhD student at the time uh, in New Zealand. And of course, this was debated in the community that Jim Henson had said that. And there were some more conservative professors saying, well, maybe it's a little bit early. Maybe it could still be within natural variability. Now, of course, nobody believes that anymore because it's clear that the temperature increase has been proceeding for decades now exactly as predicted by climate scientists already in the 70s and 80s. Um, I'll get back to that point uh, later on as well. And uh, yeah, in uh, 1990, the first IPCC report appeared. In 1992, there was a Rio Earth Summit where the framework convention on climate change uh, was agreed to by all nations with the goal to prevent a dangerous global warming. And um, yeah, that was 92. We know how successful uh, or not this has been, this pledge, uh, if you look at the further uh, evolution of global temperature. I mentioned the fact that the Earth's energy balance determines the global temperature. And this energy balance is uh, very well understood because uh, it's not a theory. We have a global radiation measurement network. We have, a we have satellite missions which measure the incoming and outgoing radiation at the top of the atmosphere. And so we know, for example, that uh, the bottom left there about 160 watts per square meter are absorbed, uh, solar radiation are absorbed at the Earth's surface. Uh, the Earth then, as I mentioned, tries to re-radiate that back into space in order to get rid of that energy that's coming in every day. Uh, if we didn't get rid of it, we would overheat within hours, basically. Just think how quickly it gets warmer when the sun rises in the morning. Uh, so we have to constantly get rid of these 160 watts. But we are actually radiating here at almost 400 watts per square meter in long wave because only a tiny fraction gets through directly. Most of it comes back in terms of this uh, back radiation, which is the greenhouse effect. And if you look at this, 342 watts per square meter absorbed back radiation. This is uh, more than twice the solar radiation we absorb at the surface. So this greenhouse effect is no small thing. It's, uh, if you try to change the global temperature, it's the biggest knob you can turn, basically. And we have turned up that knob. So sometimes I give talks where the organizers uh, like to have polls from the audience with their mobile phones. You can answer the quiz questions or so. And uh, if you ask people what they think, how much of the modern global warming is caused by human activities, the majority still reliably gets this wrong. Um, only a minority knows that it's actually 100%. 
probably even slightly more because, of course, there are these uncertainty ranges. So within uncertainty, the observed warming agrees to the computed anthropogenic warming that we can calculate from that uh, energy balance. Um, but you can also look at the natural factors that could potentially cause warming like solar activity or orbital cycles or volcanism. And uh, because solar activity has been declining in the last uh, 70 years or so, uh, it has slightly counteracted human-caused warming. And there are no other reasons why the planet should warm. And so we can say that probably humans have caused slightly more than 100% of the observed warming. And it would have been slightly more if solar activity hadn't uh, declined. I'll come back to solar activity also. Uh, in a few minutes. Um, final point here, if we look at the Earth history, we can also now reconstruct global average temperature going back uh, to the last ice age from the decades of paleoclimate research done with uh, sediment cores and ice cores taken uh, around the globe in many places. And uh, this clearly shows, uh, first of all, the transition here from the last ice age, which is down here, about seven degrees warming into the Holocene. Then we have, at the beginning of the Holocene, Homo sapiens invented agriculture and started to settle down and build cities. And since then, we have benefited from a very stable climate, uh, which we have now left behind. Uh, we are already now outside the range of Holocene climate variability, and you have to go back about uh, 120,000 years to the Eemian interglacial before the last ice age to encounter uh, climates that are similarly warm or even slightly warmer. So we are catapulting ourselves out of the Holocene at a pretty great speed because the warming out of the ice age was about one degree per thousand years. And now we've seen more than one degree in the last 100 years, and we are now at about zero point degrees per decade, so 20 times faster than the transition from the last ice age, which hopefully you all know is due to orbital cycles. I learned that in school in the 1970s because it actually was already uh, clarified by Milankovic in the 1920s what the cause of the ice age cycles are, is. If we zoom into that for the last uh, 2,000 years since the birth of Christ, this again just illustrates how uh, at, at the breakneck speed this uh, modern warming is, which uh, of course creates a problem in itself. We're not only outside the Holocene climate where all our uh, the nature we have around us and the agriculture is adapted to, but we're also changing at uh, such a huge speed that adapting is becoming very, very difficult. With that curve, I'm coming to the public debate, and I want to start with uh, the so-called hockey stick war. Uh, this revolves around a publication by a young postdoc, Michael Mann, with two senior colleagues together, senior paleoclimate uh, scientists, in Geophysical Research Letters in 1999, uh, which was the first reconstruction of the Northern Hemisphere temperature for the last millennium. And it shows that, you know, how unusual that modern temperature rise is. And at first it went uh, unnoticed for a couple of years, but it uh, turned up then in the third IPCC uh, report a few years later in, I think it was 2001, and uh, it was then, um, because the curve then became prominent, it became a major focus of attacks on the credibility of the scientists. Uh, the, a massive campaign against this started, uh, court cases, threats, at the height of the anthrax scare, an envelope with a white powder was sent to Michael Mann, which made uh, <coughs> Uh, the police evacuate the university building, for example, where he worked. And uh, unfortunately, quite a few media uh, took up that climate skeptic narrative uh, from the fossil fuel lobby and declared this, this curve as wrong or even fraudulent. 
I was I just give you one example. I have a couple of examples also from the German media because that's uh, where I live and work. This is one from a conservative newspaper, Die Welt, which uh, basically uh, said that um, the hockey stick uh, has been corrected. It, it was wrong. And uh, it said that a demolished hockey stick keeps climate researchers on their toes. Uh, but um, yeah, there are a few problems with uh, that narrative. This, this is a supposed correction of the hockey stick curve, which claims that in the 14th, 15th century, it was already once as warm as uh, in the modern time. But the problem is that this supposed correction didn't come from any paleoclimatologist, but it came from Steve McIntyre, who has been uh, working until then for 30 years in the mining industry, and Ross McKittrick, he, he was a neoliberal economist at a think tank. And uh, it was this curve was never published in the reputable scientific literature. Uh, a particular kind of deceptive aspect of this article is that it, it kind of presents the case as if this correction, supposed correction of the hockey stick curve, resulted from a correction that men and colleagues published in Nature magazine, uh, even though this corrigendum that they published explicitly stated that it changes absolutely nothing about the curve. It was just correcting the supplementary information with all the list of uh, data series that had gone into constructing this curve. Um, that journalist, Axel Brojanowski, has gone on to this day to lift climate skeptics' <coughs> narratives into mainstream German media and thereby given, giving them some kind of credibility, which in the scientific community they simply do not have. But there were, even in the scientific literature, some baseless attacks on the man at al hockey stick curve, for example, uh, this was probably the most prominent example by Willy Soon and uh, Sally Berliunas in climate research. Uh, it actually led then to stepping the whole e editors of that journal stepping down because they had published uh, this dubious uh, article. Um, it was a review, no original research, but the scientists that had conducted and published the original r research protested against kind of distortion of their results in this paper. The paper was funded with $53,000 by the American Petroleum Institute. And uh, it later was also found that uh, Willy Soon had uh, received over a million uh, dollars in funding from fossil fuel companies, including Exxon. Uh, and he had uh, kept this secret. He didn't disclose his conflict of interest with with papers that he published in journals where you have to disclose such a conflict of interest. Now, just uh, two decades uh, later, uh, with big paleoclimate projects collecting data from around the world, um, we know a lot more about the evolution. We now have a kind of hockey stick curve, which I showed in a different color version uh, earlier on for the last uh, 2,000 years. So the hockey stick has now been extended from 1,000 to 2,000, and it uh, covers the globe and not just the northern hemisphere as the original 1999 study. And uh, uh, the observed temperature has gone even higher, and the uncertainty range around that uh, curve is now also smaller than in the original Man et al. curve. But if you put the Man et al. curve from 1999 on top of this, it basically sits exactly on top of the modern knowledge. So uh, the authors of this study have received numerous prizes, are highly regarded in the scientific community. But basically, for decades, it has been almost like a membership card of the climate uh, skeptics community to claim that there's something wrong with Mike Mann's hockey stick. Uh, Michael Mann actually wrote a great book about this uh, called The Hockey Stick and the Climate Wars. And for those who read German, I also on my blog have a kind of short summary of this whole debate with further references. So let's 
go on to some other examples, concrete examples, uh, because I, I've been working in paleoclimate myself since the 1990s, so that's why I like showing paleoclimate examples, but also uh, it simply is one of the most common climate skeptic arguments to say, but climate has always changed. You know, you've probably all heard this argument. And uh, a lot of fake curves circulate in the social media about this. That particular one, you know, I saw it again last week. It's been, been there for decades. It's actually originally from a German colleague, uh, Dietrich uh, Schönwiese, who, whom I uh, know well, who published this uh, in a textbook uh, nearly 30 years ago when there wasn't much in terms of paleoclimate data. And uh, it's a hand-drawn curve, but it's based on the, the, the fact, uh, it's, it's based on the Camp Century ice core in Greenland. That was the, the first one drilled from 1963 to 1966. And this curve only tells you, of course, about the local temperature in northern Greenland at the site of this ice core. And uh, the data end before global warming really took off. So um, the claim here on the left here, it says average northern hemisphere temperature and goes from whatever, 11 to 17 degrees Celsius. That's complete bullshit. The real data, they, they are, of course, sub-zero temperatures because we're in northern Greenland. This, this is a fake legend there uh, put on the y-axis. And also this, this thing here at the end that this is supposedly the anthropogenic global warming hysteria. Uh, um, that is also complete bullshit. Um, also this predicted. Uh, Mini Ice Age is also bullshit. It's, it's not in the original Schönwiese curve. There, there are many versions in German, in English, and other languages. And it comes up again and again on Twitter, for example. It's just one of these examples of a kind of um, denial narrative, which I, I always tend to say that this kind of uh, lies just illustrate that the denial community has no honest arguments. They simply don't. So they come up with. Uh, complete nonsense like this. Now, here's another example. This actually is from this year, um, also seen on Twitter. Steve Milloy, this, this is a fossil fuel lobbyist, who here claims that global cooling, you know, the last eight years, global cooling despite massive CO2 emissions. Uh, and, you know, the disturbing thing is down here. 13.4 million people have seen this tweet. I have never achieved uh, even above 1 million, even though I'm one of the five uh, Twitter climate scientists with the most followers there. Uh, the, the deniers, the fossil fuel uh, lobby, gets much more bandwidth, basically, with this kind of bullshit. There's a very nice uh, um, animation of the global temperature since the uh, 1970s, and it basically consists of, of a lot of global cooling episodes, right? So basically, after every big El Nino event, you get uh, seven, eight, or even 10 years of global cooling, etc. cetera. Um, so we have known this, you know, people who've been in this business for a few decades, you know, we have repeatedly seen this uh, global cooling claims after every new record uh, in the global temperature. There are a few years where that it takes until the next record is being broken because there's natural variability superimposed on the global temperature. So skeptical science, I will recommend them again later on. They, they do a very good job at systematically debunking this kind of nonsense, but it still has huge bandwidth. It's a typical example of cherry picking. Another example in, in my own research field uh, of sea level rise, where I also have done quite a bit of work, is uh, Björn Lomborg. He's a very uh, successful uh, climate skeptic, has been for decades writing bestsellers on this. Uh, lots of editorials by him published around the world in the media. And uh, he, one of them was in The Guardian in 2008, uh, where he wrote that over the past two years, really long period, um, sea levels have not increased at all. Actually, they show a slight drop. Should we not be told that this is much better than expected? I like that wording because it's a typical insinuation that climate scientists are telling you lies. You know, They're not telling you that 
sea level is really dropping and it's much better than expected. Uh, what I also really liked about this article is the title. It said, let the data speak for itself and he didn't show the data. So I, I published a comment in The Guardian showing the data. And um, yeah, when he published his article, this brief pause in sea level rise was already over. Anyway, if, if he had taken the most current data, anyone could have seen that already. But if you just look at the, the background, you know that there is natural variability, like in all geophysical time series. Now, he's earning a lot of money uh, with this kind of climate denial. Who, want, who wouldn't want an annual salary of $775,000? And that is just from his work for one think tank and uh, not just uh, even the income of his best sellers and so on. Um, I wrote a commentary on Björn Lomborg on our Real Climate blog, which, um, yeah, if you want to read more on him, yeah, I, I asked the question, is he just a scientist with a different opinion? Uh, spoiler, no, he has never published anything of substance in the scientific literature. So, in fact, the sea level rise is not only continuing, it is accelerating. And now if you look at the really long-term curve, you see that little blip that uh, Lomborg used to claim that sea level is dropping. It's, it's hardly visible, really, in the data. It's just a tiny, one of these tiny fluctuations. Now, actually, the denial of sea level rise is a whole subcategory of climate denial. And... Um, there's a nice article uh, once by some American sea level uh, expert colleagues uh, about denying sea level rise. Uh, that was especially about debates in North Carolina. Uh, I was myself uh, in North Carolina uh, doing some field work there, drilling sediment cores on the, on the coast of North Carolina. Um, and we also did a stakeholder dialogue. You actually see me in this comic here. This, this is supposed to me, be me. Um, <laughs> um, so th this is a comic actually put out by the uh, German Advisory Council on Global Change, which is a government-appointed uh, body that I was a member of for eight years. And we publish, uh, published serious reports, uh, of course, but uh, one of them about the great transformation to a sustainable uh, global society also came out in the form of a comic book. So if you're thinking about uh, science communication, there's also one option. And uh, yeah, we held this uh, while we were doing the field work uh, there uh, on, on the sandy coast of North Carolina. We also held a stakeholder workshop. And it was, was very interesting to me to see that they're the big stakeholders that deny sea level rise. It's not actually the fossil fuel lobby, but it, it, it was um, uh, the real estate lobby. Because of course, the, the real estate, there are really expensive uh, houses there right on the coastline. It's beautiful coastline, um, but they are kind of gradually eroding away and uh, falling into the ocean. And of course, uh, it really devalues the real estate at the waterfront and the the real estate lobby didn't want to hear that. This actually went even as far as in, in uh, neighboring Virginia. A uh, lawmaker uh, said that sea level rise is a left-wing term and uh, can't be used in official government reports. So this, this is the most uh, uh, bizarre thing that just a factual thing like sea level rise is considered politically charged and a left-wing term. Yeah. Um, I don't believe in global warming. Um, uh, this is, well, what's this, what's this uh, sprayer artist? I just can't remember the name now. Banksy, Banksy exactly, Banksy. This, this is a Banksy piece of art here. Um, yeah, with, with that I, I come to a kind of next little subchapter, the kind of common characteristics of climate science uh, denial, and there is this nice uh, Flick model developed uh, by John Cook and others. Uh, fake experts is the first point here. We often see these fake experts on television that in reality are fossil fuel lobbyists posing as climate experts. And uh, I just this morning 
going through Twitter. It's, it's a bad habit to look at Twitter when I wake up first thing in the morning, I have to say. Um, I saw my NASA colleague, uh, Gavin Schmidt. He has a whole thread about debating these fake experts, uh, contrarians on television. Uh, the conclusion basically that he draws is that uh, it's not worth it. And uh, I have for decades uh, not debated climate deniers uh, on TV or radio. So, you know, I would in writing because that's a, it's a different matter, but uh, in a live debate, basically, uh, it just promotes the idea that people come away with the idea that the experts disagree, you know, that, that there are two sides to this and uh, people can't decide who's right, which completely confuses them about the fact that there actually is a consensus. And so my approach is when I get asked by some radio show or so to debate a climate uh, denier, I say, okay, I'm ready to debate everyone as long as they have a reasonable publication record on this topic in the peer-reviewed literature. And then these uh, radio or TV people go and look and realize, oops, oh, this guy has never done any uh, climate research. And uh, I have several times had the success that they dropped this whole approach of having a debate with a denier in the first place and just invited me to for an interview or so because they realize um, that you know the other person was a fake expert and not a real expert. Uh, as a counter example, uh, that's already quite a few years ago, maybe 15 or so, there was a, once a famous, uh, well-known German TV talk show and they invited our director, then John Schellenhuber. And then a few days before the show, they rang up our press department and asked, don't you know anyone who denies all this? We don't find anyone. And so they really wanted to, to get somebody um, just to have a controversial debate about whether there is anthropogenic climate change or not. And in the end, there was somebody in this program who had uh, never published anything in the international peer-reviewed literature, but was claiming climate change is due to solar activity. Uh, actually, somebody from Berlin. Um, second point here, logical fallacies. Uh, a, a classic one is, uh, say, climate has always changed, so humans can't be the cause of this climate change. This is obviously not uh, logical. Impossible expectations is uh, people demanding an experimental proof that the observed global warming is really due to human activities. Um, that's obviously not something that science can deliver, some kind of mathematical proof. We can only deliver overwhelming evidence in favor uh, for this. Um, cherry picking, I already showed you one example or two examples actually with uh, Milloy and Lomborg. And then uh, there are conspiracy theories because, of course, if you are trying to say that uh, all climate scientists are wrong um, and there are, you know, many thousands of climate scientists around the world, if you add them all up, uh, you have to come up with some explanation why, why, the, why would they do this, uh, you know, some conspiracy theory. You know, just, just think of what a fantastic movie plot this would be, you know, thousands of climate scientists conspire to deceive the whole world, but only a few fossil fuel bosses see through this plot, you know. <laughs> this is a fantastic movie idea. Um, so, you know, without some kind of conspiracy, you can't explain what's going on. Um, there is a very nice uh, poster. This is uh, by Skeptical Science, with, uh, led by John Cook and also a German sister uh, website, Klimafakten. Uh, they have put this nice poster explaining these five methods of uh, scientific denialism. You have a question? Yeah. Uh, so people on the climate denial side will probably some of these same allegations about the uh, anthropogenic climate change camp that you guys start the like, baselines at the very end of the last medieval ice age, or you just, it's, you're saying a lot of these people are funded by big oil, big coal. A lot of those people will also say, well, there's tons of money in like, the green movement and the environmental lobby. Uh, when thinking about how to like counter that perspective, do you actually go like point by point? Because uh, otherwise, it's, it, 
it seems like you're giving credence to like the false equivalency between the two sides, but there are some like legitimate uh, well, people think that there are legitimate criticisms of the guy the climate sciences are also being some down of cherry picking. So how do you think about combating those narratives? Well, I mean they the, these um uh, I, I can say the website skepticalscience.com has a kind of encyclopedic collection of all the denier arguments and you will find the counter arguments to these points there. Uh, to be very brief, I mean ending of the little ice age is not a physical mechanism that will cause unprecedented warming and we show the data as far as we have and uh, I showed you them going back way before the last little ice age, namely more than 20,000 years back. And um, the big, you know, the fossil fuel industry is uh, one of the biggest industries on the planet and they make huge profits compared to uh, which the entire climate science effort is pocket money. And there is not big funding in promoting uh, a false climate change <coughs> narrative. The big money is always in the industries of the past, the status quo, uh, which are trying to suppress the fledgling uh, and new things. Uh, the, the renewable industry is now getting bigger, obviously, but uh, it, uh, for the last decades, has been very, very tiny in comparison. Anyway, I, I won't want to get into this. I, I want to continue with a, a nice, well, not nice, uh, example of conspiracy theories. Maybe the most egregious uh, example of conspiracy theory is that climate scientists are planning a global genocide. Um, yeah, that's true. <laughs> Some people promote this. And uh, for a while, this, this uh, uh, La Rouge movement was pretty big on this. Uh, they were out there uh, with banners protesting um, quite a few of my talks that I have given. And here's one at the Nobel laureate meeting in Stockholm uh, that we were actually from the Potsdam Institute involved in organizing. Uh, and uh, I, I talked to these guys that were standing outside here. Shane, who was our director from the Potsdam Institute at the time. Um, these guys kind of handed out leaflets saying we're planning the global genocide and I talked to them and they were actually flown in from Berlin by that La Rouge movement to come to Stockholm and stand there and protest. Uh, totally bizarre. <coughs> so useful resources to counter misinformation this is just a very short list because this debate has been going on for quite a few decades now. There are a lot of really good resources. I already mentioned the skepticalscience.com and klimafakten.de which kind of systematically uh, are devoted to countering misinformation. Blogs like our own Real Climate blog which was um, uh, ranked by Nature magazine as one of the top science blogs of the world. Then there's a debunking handbook and uncertainty handbook um, by Steve Lewandowski, who is sitting back there. Hi, Steve. <laughs> so um, then um, there's a handbook in German to how to talk about climate, because uh, yeah, if you have relatives or so, uh, for example, or colleagues, uh, it, this is a difficult issue how to talk to those that are really uh, stuck with these climate denial narratives. And in case you get into legal trouble, uh, there is a climate science legal defense fund in the United States because uh, some colleagues there have been the subject uh, of uh, court cases. I have been myself actually here in Germany uh, for a blog article that I wrote. And um, so it's good to have some support in some cases. I want to move on to who is actually funding all this climate denial. And uh, uh, here's one example. The uh, company ExxonMobil has been uh, publishing for many, many years so-called advertorials. Uh, these are things that look, you know, in major US newspapers like New York Times. They, they look like editorials, but in the small print, you can see that they're actually paid for by Exxon. I don't actually think this kind of thing exists in Germany. It's, it's quite, I mean, an advertorial is, I don't know how, it, how it's not somehow corruption, actually. Um, <laughs> it's, it's weird. And, and it's totally fake arguments. This, this one is just an example that I picked out. 
um, because this argument has been used by the, our right-wing German uh, AFD party in the election campaign, uh, saying that only 3 to 4% of the CO2 emissions come from human activities and the rest is coming from nature. Uh, that, of course, is a total deception because it uh, basically um, compares a closed cycle with added carbon dioxide. You know, what nature does is in, in the summer, there's a lot of photosynthesis taking up CO2, and then in the winter when there's little photosynthesis and um, biomass rots, etc., it gets released again. It's a closed cycle. I mean, the, the release of CO2 in nature from rotting biomass is, can only release CO2 that was taken up out of the atmosphere beforehand. So it, it can never actually increase uh, the, the CO2 unless you have a mass die-off of forests, of course. And uh, that's also the reason why, you know, in the, uh, throughout the Holocene, the CO2 concentration was practically constant uh, because the natural cycles are cycles. But what we are doing now is adding CO2 to the, to the atmosphere. And uh, even if that's only at a rate of 3 to 4%, if you compare it to the, that turnover in the cycle, uh, it's still 100% of the reason why CO2 is increasing. So we have actually increased CO2 by 50% over what it was until about 150 years ago. Uh, and that's 100% human activity. So this is, this is just simply a deception. Um, basically, any uh, person in a company should recognize it, that uh, it, it kind of compares turnover to a net profit. And that's uh, not very reasonable. Now, there's a lot of money behind this, not only by Exxon. There was a, a relatively recent uh, article in Forbes showing that just in a single year, these five big oil companies had uh, spent more than $200 million on anti-climate science lobbying and lobbying against climate uh, mitigation measures. This is really a big amount of money. And then a lot of that uh, goes into uh, foundations where you can't even really uh, sometimes track where the money is coming from. Uh, for example, the, this network of think tanks like the Frontiers of Freedom Foundation or the Heartland Institute, Global Warming Policy Foundation in Great Britain, um, they were basically the same people that drove the Brexit campaign. And uh, the Heartland Institute even had a billboard campaign next to motorways with these billboards um, showing the uh, convicted terrorist uh, Ted Kaczynski saying, I still believe in global warming, do you? I mean, that was so over the top that they actually lost funding from uh, quite a few uh, donors from industry over that because that kind of was too embarrassing uh, even for them. Now, getting back to Exxon, the fossil industry knew exactly what it was doing. Um, this is an Exxon projection of climate change due to CO2 rise, climate change and CO2 rise actually, from 1982 from internal Exxon documents that were uh, um, turned up by a journalistic uh, research and uh, made public. And you can see uh, here on the left, it's a CO2 curve and the right is a temperature curve uh, with the scale on the right. And the red lines show what then, what really has happened until now. It is pretty much exactly what Exxon uh, predicted in 1982. Um, they even predicted slightly faster CO2 rise and uh, slightly more uh, warming than actually happened. And uh, also really interesting, in 1977, uh, an Exxon scientist, James Black, presented this uh, to its, uh, the, the company CEOs. Uh, this is a temperature curve over the last full glacial cycle. So here you have this, this last interglacial, the Eemian that I mentioned 120,000 years ago, maybe slightly warmer than the Holocene. The Holocene here is the end. Here, that's our Holocene. And uh, you go slowly into the Ice Age with these cycles that come from the precession cycle of the Earth orbit, a 23,000 year cycle superimposed on that. That's these waves. And um, 
the red line is when we force our climate model in my department uh, with the, these Milankovitch cycles that Milutin Milankovitch uh, um, discovered in the 1920s. If you drive the climate models with that, we basically reproduce the, uh, the ice age cycles, even going back three million years, we reproduce all the ice ages with the climate model. And uh, it, it pretty well agrees uh, with what Exxon knew at the time. And the interesting point here is that um, this Exxon scientist predicted a carbon dioxide induced super interglacial, so warmer than normal interglacials like this last interglacial here. Uh, that's, and the black curve went up to here. Um, this is actually a two degree warming scenario that we added there for anthropogenic warming in our model simulation, added to the Milankovitch cycles. And uh, this scientist was only wrong on one count, namely that he thought that uh, you know, the black curve goes back down again there. So after about 5,000 years, global warming would be over. And uh, only later, he couldn't know better at the time, only later it was understood that the CO2 remains in the atmosphere much longer. It remains elevated for hundreds of thousands of years. Um, that's the kind of uh, long tail of global warming that we are causing because of the very long residence time of carbon dioxide in the atmosphere. And actually we are, um, in, in my department, we have uh, research projects uh, funded by both the Swiss and the German nuclear power authorities uh, to predict the coming ice ages up to a million years ahead of time because uh, of course you can calculate these orbital cycles with astronomic precision millions of years back and into the future. Um, Milankovic did this on with pencil and paper when he was in prison at the time. Nowadays we can do that. Uh, he was in prison not because he had committed a crime but uh, because he had the wrong politics. And um, yeah, you need to know when the earth will be dug up by big ice sheets again if you build a nuclear waste storage site. And that's why we get the funding to predict the, the next ice ages with the climate model. And it turns out that we already have elevated the CO2 enough now to prevent the next ice age, which would have started in 50,000 years. And if we continue emitting, uh, we will cancel more and more ice ages up to uh, a million years into the future. Now back to Exxon, um, we recently this year published a paper in Science looking systematically at the projections, uh, quantitative uh, projection curves found in these internal Exxon documents. Uh, this was uh, done together with Jeffrey Supran and Naomi Oreskes from Harvard University. They are science historians and um, all these uh, black lines and gray lines uh, are projections from Exxon, mostly done by Exxon scientists themselves, in some cases uh, ones that they took from the academic community and uh, put into internal reports. And uh, the, the lighter the gray, the earlier this projection starts, so the, the, the black ones are the, the last ones. You see the, the very earliest from the 1970s um, that, that goes up here, that overestimated the global warming. From the 1980s onwards, they were all in the right magnitudes here compared to what then actually happened in terms of global warming. And if you compute a skill score uh, of these Exxon projections, they're actually just sl slightly better than those coming out of the academic research community. And of course, not a single one projects much less global warming or even no global warming. Um, but of course, that the latter is exactly what the Exxon decided to tell the general public in all these advertorials that the science was really uncertain and we didn't know whether it would cause any global warming. Um, they really knew better, even quantitatively, they knew exactly what was coming. And uh, our UN General Secretary Guterres uh, uh, was in the World Economic Forum in Davos. Uh, that was about a week after our paper appeared in Science and he said that we learned last week that certain fossil fuel producers were fully aware in the 1970s that their core product was baking our planet, just like the tobacco industry 
They rode roughshod over their own science. Big oil peddled the big lie, and like the tobacco industry, those responsible must be held to account. I fully agree with that, and there is quite a few court cases ongoing now uh, against Exxon and other fossil fuel companies. Um, you know, different different approaches trying to get uh, them to fund climate protection measures like flood protection, trying to force them like a case against VW in Germany to actually in the future reduce their emissions. And uh, I think also court cases for deceiving uh, the shareholders, for example, by not uh, openly communicating the risks to uh, their industry. So there is a whole doubt industry, and uh, I always like this uh, Guardian uh, headline, doubt over climate science is a product with an industry behind it. That really sums it up, and uh, it has been very effective, this product. Actually, there is a famous also internal uh, memo from a PR advisor which says doubt is our product, and so the whole uh, attempt by the fossil fuel industry has just been to sell doubt to the public and uh, they have really delayed the climate protection measures and they have brought us into this conundrum uh, that we're basically stuck in now. So it's a very, very tough decision here, prioritize profits uh, of big oil CEOs uh, or back the Green New Deal, it's a nice cartoon. Uh, well, tough, what shall we do? One, one reason why this is such a debate is also, I see a big role of the media there. False balance, rich owners is uh, what I call this. And here's a nice cartoon by John Cook. Um, this, this scenario, of course, we have all seen over and over again on television. Um, you know, al already uh, Stephen Schneider decades ago, one of the real pioneers of climate communication used to say, that this climate denial uh, is in, on TV is like uh, when if every time there was a report on television about a satellite launch, they would invite someone from the Flat Earth Society to give a different perspective. And of course, there's also academic literature about this, this balance as bias idea, the false balance. And this study, for example, concludes that the US prestige press, you know, this is not Fox News, this is the prestige press coverage of global warming from 1988 to 2002 has contributed to significant divergence of popular discourse from scientific discourse. That also really sums it up nicely. What we debate at scientific conferences has basically nothing to do with the, the popular debate about climate science. And that's why the people out there, they don't know that there has been a scientific consensus on human-caused global warming for decades now. Uh, there are some old studies uh, that starts here, 2009, the top left, which found that there's a 97% consensus uh, amongst climate scientists. There are more recent studies in the lower panel here going up to 2021, you know, just, it's always more than 97%. I, I would say from my personal experience uh, going to conferences, it's definitely more than 99% of climate scientists that agree with a consensus on human-caused global warming. I, for, for at least 10, 15 years, I have not seen somebody at a scientific uh, climate conference claim there is some doubt about this being caused by human activities. But the public doesn't know that, um, you know, in the past or in the US, the public typically thinks that uh, there's kind of half and half split amongst climate scientists on this topic. Even in Europe, even recently, as recently as last year, uh, the people still think that maybe 30, 35% of climate scientists disagree on uh, human caused global warming, which is just uh, completely wrong. So there's a completely false uh, perception. That's why it's called balance as bias. The, the public is completely wrong about this because the media are constantly uh, showing fake debates on this topic. Um, here's a, another prime example. I'm just looking at the clock. I have to speed up a little bit, but um, prime example 
very successful television film, The Great Global Warming Swin Swindle. Um, it had one of these fake paleoclimate curves. It said now, where it actually ends uh, before global warming started, it showed this uh, correlation between solar activity and temperature. Now, temperature in blue. Now, if you actually extended the data to the time where this TV program appeared, oops, um, they have really, uh, since the 1980s, they have, they have really separated. You know, solar activity has gone down, temperature has gone up. Uh, the filmmaker said this is a controversial, or the, I think it was the, the, the television uh, channel who said that um, it's a controversial film, but we feel that it is important that all sides of the debate are aired. It's again this idea, give equal time to the flat earthers. And um, the filmmaker, he was confronted on Australian TV live about why he left out these data. And um, he just said, oh, well, you, you know, I wanted to show the state of knowledge at the time, you know, in the past, total nonsense. In Germany, we also have this fake uh, debate, even covers of big news magazines. Uh, Forscherstreit means debate among scientists. And so when you read the actual article, whether there is no climate disaster because uh, there will perhaps be a cold time because of uh, the declining solar activity, the sources of that uh, so-called controversy uh, was uh, some Siberian scientist that nobody in our science community has ever heard of. Then the science organization, that's what I said, Friends of Science. No. <laughs> If you hear an organization with the name Friends of Science, you should be immediately very suspicious. And in fact, it is an astroturfing group funded by the Canadian fossil fuel industry. And then they cited the European Institute for Climate and Energy, as if this was a European Institute for Climate and Energy, and not a group of pensioners with a climate denialist website which I think is the role of the media to disclose, you know, what, what is this group that calls itself European Institute for Climate and Energy, but in an interview once said, we don't need climate scientists. So um, we also have a very prominent uh, CEO of RWE, which is the largest CO2 emitter in Europe, German power company, mainly coal. Um, who claimed it's the sun stupid, it's a quote from him. Um, he wrote a whole book called, nicely actually, the nice title, The Cold Sun. Then you scratch your head and you have a problem. How do you put this together that there's a cold sun but global warming? And the answer is of course, global warming is, uh, global cooling is just ahead. It's just around the corner. And he even published a, a quantitative a prediction curve in this book. It's uh, the climate projection that has uh, been falsified the fastest from all the ones I've ever seen. But he's still popular in the media and gives a lot of talks. Okay, uh, still on the media topic, uh, Wall Street Journal, there was a nice analysis of how many editorials and how many columns uh, over a long time stretch here, more than 10 years, have mentioned the fact that uh, climate change has actually something to do with fossil fuels, uh, almost none, as you can see. Uh, why is that so? It's because uh, Wall Street Journal belongs to Rupert Murdoch's media empire, which is probably uh, the biggest perpetrator of climate misinformation over the last decades around the world. Uh, they own Fox News uh, in Britain, the tabloid The Sun, The Times, the British TV satellite channel B Sky B. Most of the Australian media are in the hands of uh, Rupert Murdoch's media empire. And that's why after these horrendous fires in Australia, they published this uh, article, Warming is Good for Us, which complains about climate activists uh, instrumentalizing the horrible fires for, for their cause. Uh, this is also quite typical that whenever as a climate scientist or activist after an extreme weather event or so you say uh, we need to do something about global warming, you're instrumentalizing the horrible victims of these uh, 
extreme event for your political purposes. Uh, just recently, you know, another one from The Sun in Britain uh, claims that there's a breakneck race to net zero. I mean, whose fault is it that we have to reduce emissions really fast to net zero now? It's the fault of those uh, media themselves and the fossil fuel industry who have delayed action if we had started reducing emissions after the Rio summit with the United Framework Convention on Climate Change in 1992, we could have reduced emissions at a very leisurely pace, but uh, now we have to hit the brakes full on. Now, in the meantime, that's my, my last point, actually almost last point. Um, the debate has shifted as was predicted uh, more than a decade ago in, in this old uh, cartoon. Um, we're actually now at uh, 400, whatever, 15 parts per million or so uh, already. And uh, the debate has now actually shifted away, at least in Europe, uh, maybe not in the US, from denying climate change uh, to um, Discourses of delay, basically uh, trying to delay, you know, acknowledging we have to protect the climate by trying to delay it. And in Germany, certainly, and also in Britain, I know there's a lot of fake news about solutions, about wind, solar, electric cars that are supposedly worse than, than uh, combustion engine cars for the environment, about batteries, about heat pumps. We have a huge heat pump debate in Germany with incredible amounts of fake news about uh, heat pumps and um, a huge campaign of the tabloid built um, against our climate and economics minister from the Green Party, uh, Habeck. Uh, you know, these are just some examples of, uh, it, it's the heating hammer uh, by Habeck where he supposedly goes into your cellar and rips out your oil heater even though the proposed legislation just said that any new heating systems installed from next year should be at least uh, getting 65% of their heating energy from renewable sources. Uh, it doesn't require you to use a heat pump for that. Um, now, the boss of that uh, publisher who publishes Build Tabloid uh, has in, in um, leaked internal communication said he really likes global warming. Actually, he's, he doesn't think one should do anything against it. It's nice to have a warmer climate. And 48% uh, or 48.5% of that publisher, Springer, um, is owned by the US private equity firm KKR, which is heavily invested in fossil fuels. So it's uh, not surprising that they do this. There's a very nice uh, also cartoon site which summarizes all these discourses of delay. They just try to delay uh, the necessary climate action. Uh, I just give a couple of examples here. This is the whataboutism, you know, what about China? You've all heard this. Individualism. So it's you as individual consumers with your CO2 footprint. You are to blame. You have to change, not politics and industry. Or no sticks, just carrots. This is the favorite argument uh, also in German politics. Uh, there shouldn't be a law requiring 65% renewables. We should just incentivize with money, you know, but then the finance minister says, oh, well, sorry, we don't have the money. And then these appeals to social justice by people that have never cared about social justice, but when it is, uh, uh, convenient to delay climate action by saying, well, that poor uh, nurse having to get by car to her job, she has to have uh, her combustion engine with cheap petrol, etc. Uh, these are all standard tactics, which probably you have all seen. So finally, what should we do? We have the Paris Accord, that is great. I want to just highlight the point that all countries have bindingly agreed to pursue efforts to limit the temperature increase to 1.5 degree for good reasons. Even Saudi Arabia, Russia have all agreed to this for very good reasons. What does it mean? Uh, you have to know that, cumul that CO2 accumulates because of the long lifetime in the atmosphere, which I've already mentioned. So it, the cumulative emissions uh, is what counts. And if you want to keep the cumulative emissions low, it, it doesn't really matter when you're climate neutral, 
uh, but the area under these curves matters. This is from the latest IPCC report. We have to go onto this blue path with uh, halving the global emissions by 2030. That's in seven years' time if we want to have a good chance to limit the warming to 1.5. And so this very steep uh, immediate decline is critical here. And uh, then you have kind of a longer tail where you have some way to deal with emissions that are very hard to get rid of, like those from agriculture. Uh, but the big you know, fossil electricity generation and fossil transport, we have to get rid of uh, really as fast as we can due to the guys who have delayed all this. Uh, we have the next climate summit coming up again in, in November. The COP is a conference of the parties. This is the 28th from their annual, annual conferences of the parties of the United Nations Framework Convention on Climate Change, uh, the one that was agreed in Rio 92. And uh, this one is headed by an oil industry CEO, Sultan Al Jabba from United Arab Emirates. And they have already launched a major astroturfing campaign on Twitter, for example, with all these fake accounts. These are artificial intelligence generated faces. They are not real people praising the environmental record of United Arab Emirates there. So to conclude, the IPCC says there is a rapidly closing window of opportunity to secure a livable and sustainable future for all. This is a statement with very high confidence. And the choices and actions implemented in this decade will have impacts now and for thousands of years. A statement with high confidence because we know about the long lifetime of CO2. Now, what I've uh, tried to tell you is that yeah, global warming has been documented, documented for decades. It threatens the continuation of civilization, peaceful living together as we know it. And politicians and society at large are still delaying the solutions to these problems, even though to this threat, even though we have the solutions, the technological ones, we just need to roll them out really fast. And a massive lobbying campaign and astonishing media failure are not the least contributing factors to that. And uh, with that, I thank you very much if you want to read more. And um, now I, I'm here for discussion and sorry for running over time a little bit. Thank you.